So where we look at the testing slash auditing third line of defense within the organization form, internal audit basically is a line there in conjunction with the first and second line helping the firm establish and achieve its objectives. They want to have a systematic, disciplined approach to evaluate and improve the effectiveness of risk management, the control, the governance process. They're looking to provide the assurance around the efficiency, the effectiveness, in addition also around the return on investment of controls that the third line is looking to evaluate and report back to leadership. In some cases, firms may be spending too much in certain areas and may have redundancies that they would look to evaluate through that third line of testing and really get an understanding of where the level of risk is being remediated best and then put in the appropriate controls around it for them. And the scope for internal audit encompasses all aspects of the organization. So in our discussion last week where we went through some of the expertise that's involved when creating the policies, you have compliance expertise, legal expertise, of course, the largest category is the information security expertise. All of these, this, this base of knowledge is used to put together and evaluate across the organization where you're going to have controls that need to be monitored, tested, and then improved to help make sure they're satisfying their goals and reducing the risk of the organization for them. So where the looks at the testing and the element that it helps is reconfirm the documentation that you have in place. So your policies we talked about in the last time is going through and identifying how you're doing certain things around your controls and protecting certain information, what you're doing specifically, the frequency that you're doing it, and ultimately who's responsible. And a lot of this ties down from your policies down to your procedures. So as you have these evidences documented on how the program is run, the testing component circles back and makes sure that where you're looking at your firewall reviews, that those reviews are done in line with where the policy suggests. Your patching policies for your software upgrades. You'll have a policy that defines how frequently you do your patching, how you execute the procedures to do your patching. So the third line of defense will come in and evaluate these areas and see that they're being done in accordance with the policies for the organization form. Um, coming into the next slide, so what really distinguishes internal audit and the third line of defense, and I, once again I'll say the internal audit function, because in some organizations it may be levered through a third party or a combination thereof internal and external resources, but the third line of defense ultimately has to have independence, has to have objectivity, they have to have themselves with some distance between the first line and the second line. It's pretty important to understand that the third line doesn't do any implementation of the controls. They don't do any design of controls. Their specific role is to test the controls as outlined per the policies and procedures. So where they evaluate the controls and may notice that if there is a inefficiency in the control or something is ineffective, that needs to be reported up to leadership, and then some remediation effort or some improvement has to be put in place for them. Essentially, the third line of defense is there to evaluate the controls and, and like a doctor, tell you objectively if something's sick, and then a discussion has to be evaluated and, and brought back to leadership, and then in conjunction with the second line of defense and, and refining your policies and making some improvements. Richard? Yeah, sure, thanks Mike. Yeah, just to, um, Add to what Mike is saying, the the role of the auditors are very important. Um, it's very key that the, the management who will get the reports from the auditors take it seriously. Um, when the regulators come in, they're looking to see that the policy and procedures in place are effective. And the only way to show that is through the testing. Um, it's very difficult if the third line of defense, which includes audit, and additional testing processes are not in place to really feel uh, comfortable if you're going to have an examination from the regulator. So it's very important to make sure that the, the third line of defense is in place and it is effective 
um, especially when it comes to uh, external auditors or regulators coming in to, to assess what's happening in the, in the firm. Uh, excellent point, Richard. And I think for those on the phone that are familiar with the SEC OCIE cybersecurity risk alerts that came out in 2014 and 15, you saw that the evolving mindset and guidance was showing now how you are actually testing the controls and having that evidence in there that they are being effective because the most important message I think to get out of today's webinar and the testing slash auditing of your controls is that if it's not tested, how do you know it's working? So a lot of times even from a test perspective or tools and technologies put in around cybersecurity that generate alerts, they generate logs, but if nobody's there to go review them and respond to them, um, then you're not going to know if, if really your tools and solutions are working to protect the firm and to achieve the objectives that you're looking for. So that being said, we're going to bring up one of our first polling questions that we'll ask firms just to support our back and give us some thoughts on how your organization is handling the information security testing. So what the first question comes up to is when reporting to leadership on your information security controls, circling back to that first slide that we started where everything has to be at some point put up to leadership. Does your firm A, it's not something we currently do, B, it's a struggle but we're working on it, C, we conduct it and it's mostly informal and ad hoc, and D, it's well defined and has a regular cadence. And what well defined would be in regards to cyber and how you want to report to leadership is really getting to that risk conversation and showing leadership reports that they can interpret, digest, and understand. Leaders of financial investment firms understand risk. It's how they built the business. And it's much better to put it in that type of format as opposed to showing them how many emails were blocked, spam emails, how many viruses may have been stopped. They really want to get an understanding of what control was put in place and how it lowered the reduction or lower the risk level in the firm. So let's take a look at our results. We have 7% in the first category, 10% in the second, 60% in the third, which is probably what I would have expected most, and it's nice to see 17% have it well-defined in a regular cadence. So talking a little bit about that regular cadence, and a lot of people will go to seminars and hear other bits of advice coming around how effectively to communicate to leadership. Understanding that with the regular cadence at a minimum should at least be an agenda item where risk is regularly discussed within the organization. Smaller firms that can work out very well, leaderships are getting together on that routine basis, add cyber in there. Things you want to talk about are the risks and threats. In some cases the conversations may be small or short, and really just looking at the delta if your risk has changed based on a geographical territory you may be moving into for business or if the threat landscape has changed. So those that have been watching the topic know that ransomware was probably the fastest growing threat to the industry in the past year form. So that's the cadence in the conversation that leadership wants to get into a little bit more. Richard? Yeah, and if, uh, if I can also add um, for the leadership, it's it's this is not just a check the box exercise, the third line of defense. Um, definitely if resources and, and budget have been invested to do the third line of defense, you know, a lot of money spent on tools, um, you have to get your return on your investment. You got to make sure that the reports are meaningful and that you have a, a handle on exactly what risk you, you have in your firm. And that's, that way you can actually address the risk, whether you want to accept it or, or mitigate it. Um, it's very important, you know, for the first line, you have those processes in place. The second line, yes, but the third line is to make sure that the first two lines work. So the whole three lines of, of defense will not be effective if all three are not working together. So definitely, um, you know, for the, for the management, you know, you have to make sure that reporting is meaningful so you can see how effective your security controls are. Yeah, no, that's absolutely true. 
Richard, and you know where you're looking at the importance of building the multiple lines. That second line of defense being right in between the first and the third is very critical and making sure you have the right documentation in place. We've seen too many firms that looked at the original SEC guidance and the regulatory requirements of having written information security policies and drafted them in either too much detail or not enough detail. And essentially what you want to have from a good policy structure, and Richard, I know this is your expertise and something you've done a lot with form, is really have a, a higher level document that talks about your risk identification, your risk acceptance, your risk mitigation, how you're handling risk at a philosophical level, and then you get into your second level of doc documentation, which is going to get into a little bit more of the procedures and lay the foundation so when firms come in to have that testing component, whether it's internal or external, whatever part of the firm is doing that, that they have it outlined and can easily reference back. I think also what Richard was mentioning before too that's pretty critical and, and why the testing is very important is that it, it's a checks and balance within the organization. One of the things that you'll see a lot of firms in the asset management space have a model where they're leveraging a lot on a third party IT provider. And so one of the things that your policies should also do is have that oversight on your third-party IT provider. Make sure that they are testing certain components. So a lot of the activities when you look at the cyber list and you're going down around governance, access rights, data loss prevention, a lot of areas to test and could be somewhat burdensome to firms if they don't have a lot of staff internally. Well, if you're leveraging to a third-party outsourced Provide, an outsourced IT provider, you should lean on them for providing evidence on certain tests that they are doing within the organization. And then you need to validate those. And in some cases, if the firm doesn't have the competency inside, it's helpful to bring in a third party that can stand in between you and your third party IT provider as a, as a translator to help validate uh, one of the things we often see, and I know Richard, this is one of your pet peeves, is the pen testers and the reports that come out. So a lot of people, and I'm going to pass to you in a second, Richard, to, to share about your thoughts on it, bring in pen testing and think it is more of that check the box exercise, but there's a lot more behind what comes out of the pen test. Richard? Yeah, exactly, Mike. Um, the, the, the key thing with the pen testing, and a lot of firms do it, um, is that the reporting is the key to me. Uh, I feel that when it comes to reporting, most of the results tend to uh, display a generic type result. But the, the firm that's tested should really look at a report to see if it, if it applies to their organization. A lot of times the results are the, the threat on a global landscape or a larger landscape. So definitely what I recommend to firms is that they review the pen test report in detail and really try to gauge if the results are applicable to their firm. If a, if a particular item comes up as a high issue, it may be high for company A but not company B because all companies have different technologies and, and controls. So um, definitely when it comes to the pen test report, you know, it's not where you accept all the results. You know, you have to really analyze it to make sure it's applicable to your firm. Yeah, and I think even more importantly, too, is sometimes we've seen on reports, right, Richard, where they may classify something as a low. Yes. But it's, it's actually high. Right. And so there's a lot of firms out there doing pen testing these days, and they have good, strong information security technology background but they don't have the asset management and financial services background, not to the intimacy to know the crown jewels of your specific organization. And so that's where Richard is definitely you know, right on the money that you just can't accept the results that come from the pen tester. You have to have some good interpretation there. So by establishing a good framework of the policy of what the firm looks like, looks for in regards to that risk identification, the risk mitigation, the risk monitoring, that's all part of being able to interpret those reports properly for them and get that information. So one of the other things also that creates somewhat of a challenge in the multiple lines of defense is that where there are multiple hats worn in an organization. 
it blurs the line and that's somewhat of a challenge because you really have to have that autonomy when it comes to the testing component. Take it back to the IT provider. Not to pick on them, but in some essence, essence where I mentioned they'll provide some tests for you, you have to have some validation of those tests. You have to have somebody else take a look at them. I use the phrase of not grading your own homework. So even if it's an internal procedure that you're evaluating your own firm's work, it's nice to have that external independent view, or when I mean external, it's just a separate role within the organization if it's large enough. But you have to have that autonomy, you have to have that unbiased opinion. It's the only way to really get a, a true measurement of the effectiveness on the control and support. Okay. So, yeah, well, one other thing to add real quick uh, before we move on is also that the regulators are expecting that the pen testers uh, vulnerability assessments that it's done by a different party every year. Um, it's definitely important to change the, the vendor who performs those tests um, because the, the vendor who does it the first time has an understanding of your environment. So to be very uh, clear in making sure you have an independent test with someone who doesn't know your environment, it's, it is recommended by the regulators to rotate your vendors who perform this test. Um, so it's something to definitely remember when it comes to the third line of defense to make sure that the second line and the, and the first line actually works. So that's a part of the testing where the rotation of the, the vendors who do this is very important. Yeah, and you can also rotate the scope at times too. So you want to prioritize your scope based on the risk, based on the threats. And one thing for sure is firms should not get a false sense of security if you get flying colors on a pen test report. Um, pen testing is the type of activity that if you gave somebody enough time and resources, they would get in. So that's where scoping it and taking a risk-based approach as to what you're going to do around your pen testing is pretty important and you know making sure that you're getting the right return on the investment that you're looking for. So we're going to bring up our second polling question right now. And we appreciate everybody's responses when we do these polls. So it's good to hear from your colleagues and see where you stand versus the other. So the second question is around the auditing and testing of your information security controls. It is not something we currently do that I'm aware of within the organization. Hopefully, I think most of the titles and roles of people on this call, it is something that they'd be aware of it's conducted. Uh, the second item is it's conducted, but mostly by our third-party information technology provider, so that outsourced IT provider. Um, third is it's conducted internally. And then the fourth, it's conducted by a third-party auditing or compliance firm, so a consulting agency, a SOC 2, firm that's coming in and doing a full evaluation, whether it's some form of attestation or an internal assessment that's going to be used by your organization to help build and improve the maturity in areas of your cybersecurity program. So we'll take a look at our results. Pretty evenly spread, 21%, 30%, 17%, and 25% rounding out the bottom spot. I have to say that's pretty close to what I would have expected. Richard? Yeah, okay. sure, definitely. And um, we appreciate the feedback. Feedback so gives us an idea where um, our audience stands on this particular question. Yeah, okay. So as we mentioned before, coming in and looking at the third line of defense, you know, in our upfront slide where we mentioned the external parties, it's good to get an understanding from external parties such as regulators, your auditors, and the role that they play in helping guide the firm with your overall governance control structure. Your external auditors will look at things around your financial controls, things that they've been doing for years before cyber became the sexy phrase and we were looking at information security and financial controls. So they can, you'll see an expansion basically of what your auditors are doing around those areas when they're coming in around your uh, financial controls, what you're doing around your data handling, around your customer information, around that personally identifiable information, things around your monetary transactions. Uh, are you 
taking redemption requests through email? Are they requiring a redemption form? Are you responding back only to the administrator with another email? Are you putting in callback procedures on wires? Is there a certain threshold for the dollar amount form? So a lot of these controls that your auditors have been looking at for many, many years will be expanding. So leverage those resources when they come into your organization. Definitely be open to hear where you can get improvements around those controls that they'll be taking a look at. You know, the regulators as the third party in establishing the requirements and what their efforts are is to really help strengthen the governance that organizations have. So where firms that may have experienced that SEC sweep exam letter that came across in the cybersecurity exams, they list out the six categories that I'm sure everybody on this call is aware of, which is the governance and risk assessments, your access rights and controls, data loss prevention, incident response, vendor risk management, and training. In the SEC sweep exam request letter that outlines the documentation, which is your policies, procedures, and evidence of testing within those six domain areas, half of the information they're looking for is all around governance. So they are specifically looking for things around policies and procedures of defined roles and responsibilities. They are looking for organizational charts. They are looking to see that you are having those internal discussions around risk. They want to see meeting minutes. They want to see what is discussed in those meetings. They want to see that firms are receiving information from that third line of defense. And then more importantly, what actions you are taking once you see those test results. And if that test result that's coming back is in line with the firm's risk appetite. So risk appetite is a, a favorite buzzword by the regulators. A lot of people kind of struggle to get an understanding what risk appetite means when it comes to cyber. You essentially look at areas around financial, regulatory, legal, business outages or service disruptions and want to make a statement in regards to what the firm's stance would be from an appetite perspective in those areas. Example would be, if we were to suffer a cyber attack, we would not, the, would not want the cost to exceed X threshold. If you are looking at a crown jewel and a key system being your email or the data that you're exchanging through email from a risk appetite statement around your business outage, you'd want to have a statement that we cannot go without our email for X period of time. If you happen to be a quant algo shop, that business outage service disruption would be around your trading algos and probably a much shorter duration than it would be around email. But those are the discussions that you want to see firms having, that you're defining what that appetite is. We like to call the risk appetite statements is defining the threshold just below somebody getting fired. So it's a a real critical aspect of your cybersecurity and your risk management program is to have that statement tied to it. Yep. Yeah, definitely. And um, basically, the, the risk appetite is what the company should define, and it's more or less um, you know what level of risk they are willing to accept. Um, so definitely, it's something that should be considered. Okay. And then coming into our next slide here, kind of a little bit more of a review as we're coming towards the tail end of the webinar today and looking at our each, I'm sorry, looking at how each of the three lines of defense have a distinct role within the firm. So to refresh again, your upfront front line is doing that risk assessment, evaluating risk, putting in your tools and technology more on the operational side. Your second is going to be that policies, procedures, the documentation, we call it the architectural blueprint for your cybersecurity program. And then the third is going to be those tests to make sure that everything is functioning as expected or as desired, or more importantly, I guess, at the maturity level that the, term has, that the firm has identified. And it's a circular effect. So once the testing is completed, reported up to leadership, leadership now has to have a discussion about risk and understand that if those controls are not up to the level that they meet, do they want to accept that risk? Maybe put in some additional 
mitigating controls or additional monitoring over those areas, or do they want to make further investment and try to bring that effectiveness of the control even higher for them? Primarily, it's going to really revolve around where a firm sets their maturity level. And maturity level, actually, I go through it a little bit further because I had a conversation earlier today where somebody said, what is maturity level? And we use that phrase a lot today, and so I think a lot of people understand what maturity means from a definition standpoint, but what does it mean from a cybersecurity perspective? Maturity is really the rating on and how you improve your maturity is going from a reactive state to a proactive state. So example would be on a scale of maturity where you're doing nothing, you'd be at the lowest level. If you're doing things that are somewhat ad hoc, then you'd go up a little bit higher in your maturity level. If you're doing things on a more routine and frequent basis, but it's not formalized, now you may be towards a three. If you're doing it and it's formalized, it's documented, uh, regularly, periodic, it's going to go a little bit higher because you'll have the documentation and the blueprint behind it. The ultimate level of maturity is having that testing component in there for them. So that's how you move from the scale of a one to a five. And that's what the regulators want to see, is that you are at that maturity level, especially in the highest risk areas of the organization, right? Agreed. Good job. Um, you know, where we look at the importance to report this up to leadership and the senior managers, the senior management, the partners, the general partnership of the firm and why they really need to be involved and have the understanding on this, um, it's their cost. It's their pocket in most cases that would have to pay the additional costs if something was to impact the organization. I think most importantly too is they understand the risk. Uh, one of the key crown jewels that we really didn't go into specifically before when talking about data, systems, and business processes is the crown jewel of the reputation, which the insurance protection that you can buy in a cyber program wouldn't protect your reputation. The only way you can minimize the damage to the reputation is going to be around your incident response. Um, we tell clients that the faster you can manage an event if it happens, the better you can maintain the control over the situation and really effectively communicate to all the people that need to be involved, whether it's going to be dealing with regulators, communicating to your investors, some cases communicating to your employees or your third-party vendors, all of that part will really help from the reputational impact and minimizing it. So one of your appetite statements would be around the reputational impact, that you'd want to minimize that. So how would you make sure that your incident response is solid? Test your incident response plan for them. And it's a lot more than just a technical test. That's really the first phase of what has happened during the incident. The true test, as we mentioned many times on cyber, is that firm-wide effort and dealing with all the responsibilities that I mentioned before, who's going to deal with the legal aspect, the compliance aspect, if law enforcement has to be involved, if you need to bring in a forensics firm, if it is that type of situation that you've suffered through the attack. So running through and testing that, and it's called an exercise more specifically than a test because you're not meant to be perfect on the first time. It is something that you want to improve and learn from as you go through the exercise form. Coming into the next part too, even though the three lines of defense are meant to be independent and have their own distinct roles and responsibilities, it is pretty important that at times they need to come together, have discussions, have an understanding of what each line is doing independently, and then as a coordinated effort, help look to improve the areas where you have weaknesses. A lot of times you may see in larger organizations duplicate efforts that get applied because one person may be working on the first line of defense, looking to button down something with a technology, a tool, a solution around data that you're dealing with a third party vendor. Somebody that's working on the business side that helped put together that third party vendor, that relationship, may be privy to information that the third party vendor has some security controls on their side that could be repetitive of what you have on your side. So getting that understanding and knowing full how 
all the controls are tied to each other or which ones may be independent can give you a better view as to where you possibly could have some savings and, and some duplications that could be removed within your organization form. We do say times and firms if you're putting in you know, multiple layers of security at some point more layers can add to the complexity and can add to more potential vulnerabilities if you're not following up and doing proper testing on all these areas, coming back to your patch management procedure. Do you have six solutions in place? That's six solutions that you have to make sure you have proper patch management on it. So it's a proper blend to what makes sense for the organization form. Yeah, definitely. I um, totally agree with what Mike has said and um, you know, certainly encourage those on the call to uh, you know, look into the fact that the, the three lines of defense have to be separate. Uh, it avoids all the potential for um, weaknesses in the controls. Yep. I think, you know, coming up a easy analogy to think about testing and the requirement there is if you had an alarm system on your house or in your house where you have your smoke alarms. If you don't test them occasionally, how do you know if they really work? So you wouldn't want to wait until you had a fire to find out if your smoke alarms didn't work. Same with your security system for your house. So it's that mindset that really helps bring the completeness of a cybersecurity program form. So that being said, I'm going to bring up just our third polling question and final polling question as we're coming in near the conclusion of our third part in this webinar series. And our third polling question, going through really circling back on topics we've talked about through the three webinars and the policies that firms need to put in place in that second line of defense, which policy would you see as most critical to reducing risk? And these are specifically picked out because of the types of firms that we have on the phone. But we're curious if firms see that cybersecurity training and awareness would be the best policy or most effective in reducing risk, or most critical, I should say, your vendor and third-party risk management, or your cyber incident response. And if you're not sure, then that's what an assessment process would help you determine which is going to be most critical to your organization. So let's take a look at our results. First one on the top, cybersecurity training and awareness. I'd have to agree with that. And the training and awareness is definitely something that is broad and covers all categories within the organization. One of the number one threat actors that comes up over and over, and when we talk about a threat actor, these are those that would potentially cause harm to the crown jewels of the organization. And it's not organized crime. It's not the hacker. It's primarily the insider and the negligent insider. And it's the insider that is negligent because they may not be aware of the firm's policies. And a lot of that is possibly because the policies and procedures are not properly documented and not effectively communicated out to the staff. And absolutely training your employees on the newer requirements around security, why they want to make sure that they're dealing with encrypted files, why they want to make sure that when they're printing out documents, they're not leaving confidential information on desks. So that clean desk policy is pretty important. That they understand why they need to adhere to certain policies around the mobile devices. You know, sometimes having a mobile device management solution may be a little inhibiting to the user experience, but it's important. Same with other types of access to your information. Two-factor authentication, a lot of people are very unhappy when they have to go through and do a second step to get into a system. It's pretty critical, it's pretty important. Password management, I think that is probably one of the biggest pain points that I see with people is they don't like to have to change their password frequently or use something that's a little more complex. Um, it's pretty important. With some of these that I've mentioned here that firms are resistant for, I'd have to say in my many, many years of experience dealing with hundreds and hundreds of alternative investment managers, I would say things like that password management policy and even your screen going to lock when you walk away from it, the biggest violators or resistors to those type tend to be the leaders of the firm. 
So that's where we circle back once again and your best efforts in your program is effectively reporting out to leadership and making sure that not only are they aware of the risks, but they are continually being updated on the risks, they're having conversation about the risks and understanding what would be the potential impacts to their organization if they should suffer some sort of cyber event. So having a robust program with the three lines of defense is going to be your best defense to keeping your data protected, to keeping your systems secure, and to minimizing the impact of a cyber event on your organization form. So that being said, we're going to just come up and actually I probably should have gone to this slide a little bit further where it's going to review once again our three lines model into the next slide. Oops. And coming into court. And so as you all know, going through our three phases here, we've talked a lot of times about third parties, how they you can leverage a third party. I think when it comes to the testing component of a program, a third party is probably most valuable when not only testing the specific controls, but also evaluating your overall cybersecurity program in regards to what the regulators would look for. It's better to be prepared before they come up and get an understanding where your gaps and weaknesses are and where you need to improve them and bring them in line with what the regulators would want. And where that line is, for most cases and most parts of your cybersecurity program, is defined internally. Setting that risk tolerance level, that risk appetite that we mentioned before, and that's where a healthy program can continue to improve by evaluating the risk on a regular and routine basis. So that being said, I think we are coming towards the tail end of the webinar. Only thing we have left is just to check and see if we have any questions that have come in during the call. Looking at one question here, I think it comes back to what you mentioned earlier, Richard. So does the SEC require penetration testing? So they want to see if you've done penetration testing. The requirement aspect really ties around to evaluating the risk. They want to see that you are evaluating if you need to do a pen test. More importantly, if you are doing a pen test, they want to see what the follow-up was from the pen test so that it wasn't simply just a check the box exercise and that you fully understood and digested the results that came out of that pen test. Richard, any thoughts from your side on the regulators on the pen test? I know you've experienced that topic with the regulators many times. Yeah, definitely. Um, it's definitely important and uh, you know most companies will do this on an annual basis. Um, certainly vendors should be doing it more frequently. Um, but one of the key things here is, is to make sure that the, the test itself, uh, which I mentioned earlier, is looked at very carefully to make sure that the results are applicable to your environment. Uh, sometimes if the changes are made without a thorough review after the fact, uh, before you implement anything, you may actually introduce more risk into your firm. So definitely, um, the regulators not only want you to do the, the test, but also want to see where you actually made any changes. How effective was the test actually? Um, it doesn't make sense to do a pen test, do nothing, do another pen test, you have the same issues. You know, some action has to be taken, uh, but definitely to review the results before you actually do anything. Absolutely. So we have one more question that will go. Uh, next question coming is, so you mentioned testing and vendor risk management. What type of testing is involved on vendors? So when you're testing your vendors, you're looking similar to the way you look at things within your own organization. You want to look at their access rights, if they have access to your data, to your systems. You might want to test how they are around their incident response. Uh, probably what's most important to test is your own vendor risk management policy, which, take it back a step, if you don't have a vendor risk management policy, you would fail that test from the regulators when they're looking to see if you have one. But more importantly, once you have the policy, is evaluating and testing your process. So part of that process is how are you risk rating your vendors? 
So not all vendors are equal based on the type of data they have, the access to your information. And then how are you also testing your workflows, making sure that you're going through the proper due diligence steps for the vendors based on their risk criteria. So are you evaluating contracts? Are you evaluating SLAs? Are you evaluating uh, how their information security protection is around their data and how they're going to protect your data as well for them? So that being said, we're at the tail end, and I should say not the tail end, we are at the end of our three-part webinar series. I want to thank everybody for your participation. We'll also be sending out a follow-up questionnaire that we really appreciate your responses. We're going to be asking in there what future webinars. We do have a couple planned already in January, so keep an eye out on your email. I think some of the feedback we've gotten already has been very helpful in framing which webinars we'll be launching in January. We look forward to your future attendance and wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving holiday. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.